the motoric thing of playing the bass is not the main part of playing bass or making music. Music is everything that surrounds us in, in every moment of our life is connected to the music we are going to do. So practice it slow, sing the parts, take it easy, try to be cultured, try, try to read, try to, to learn from other people. Remember that uh, to teach and to learn is the same thing with different, in many languages it's the same word, and to be humble. I had such a fabulous time hanging out in Tijuana, Mexico with Diego Zacharias earlier this year. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contra Race Conversations. And have you ever felt like you've known someone your entire life? Well, I totally feel that way with Diego. We talk about that and much more in this interview. Down in Tijuana, I got a chance. I thought, oh, I'll have plenty of time to interview Diego. Well, Diego, talk about a giving person. Every moment of every day that he could possibly find, he was teaching the Mexican bass students at just, it was unbelievable. I caught him, I think the final day, and we went to Andres Martin, the host for the Latin American Double Bass Festival that Diego and I were at. If you're not familiar with Diego, he is originally from Montevideo, Uruguay, and he is the principal bass in the Galicia Symphony Orchestra. He's been there since 2002. He's a super active double bass soloist and teacher, is one of the most active, exciting double basses out there on the scene right now. We found a moment in Andres' bass studio and chatted, and it was such a fantastic conversation. Diego and I could have chatted for another three hours easily. So this just begins to scratch the surface of this great artist and person, and I just feel so honored to be on faculty with somebody like Diego. I know you're going to love this conversation. You're going to be hearing some music from his most recent album, which is an album featuring double bass solo duo quintet pieces. And you'll be hearing some pieces from Simon Garcia and Dave Anderson, who are two past podcast guests and two really exciting double bass performer, teacher, artists that are out there these days. And we have some great sponsors for this episode as well. Upton Bass, String Instrument Company, and Diderio Strings. More on them later. But let's dig into this episode with Diego Zacharias. I feel so privileged to be at events like this and to get, like you're somebody that I feel like I've known for years even though we've actually only met like you know four days ago or something like that in person but it's so cool I feel so honored and privileged to be able to play chamber music with you you know these different groups and to see you perform and then to see you teach and it's just so cool but I'd love to maybe we can start at the very beginning and just take me through like how it, how it was for you growing up in Montevideo did you grow up in Montevideo itself yes I did okay I, I started when I was 14 to play e-bass like uh -huh. all of us somehow right yeah and playing in a band <laughs> with my brother and then I was always always interested by the by the classical music, the orchestras, the sound. I didn't get to to listen to much uh, concerts, but uh, I was always interested. So as as soon as I could, uh, when I was seventeen, I went to the conservatory for an open open class, double bass open class. So I sit down there with my long hair and my rock uh, rock <laughs> clothes and my funky bass. And then came the teacher, and he played just open strings. And suddenly I realized that that's the sound. That's the sound I want to get with my bass, with my amplifier. With it. That's the sound I want to get. So when I was 18, I started to, to learn bass. And then I, I did uh, almost a year in Montevideo, because uh, I, I wanted really to, to, to know the world and, and to see what is happening all around, I had uh, I was working already for myself in very young age, so I said, okay, let's let's travel. So I took the telephone book, you know, mm -hmm. and I started to call all the embassies 
asking which country has a scholarship to go to study music. There. Really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I got the one in Sweden that they told me yes, but you need to wait like six months. So I say in six months when you're 18, it's like, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I called the Israeli embassy and they told me, yes, if you get in the, in the university, uh, you have two years of scholarship. So I went back to my teacher and said, I need to record the Simandel, Marcello, and Capuzzi concerto. I never practiced, no one of them, it's true. Right? The three, I didn't know the pieces. So he told me, what for? I say, scholarship. All right, let's do it. So I was working like mad, like two months, and I did a VHS, no? That, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Right, right. And I sent it. And after a couple of weeks, they accept me in the first year of the university there. So I pack everything, base and luggage, and... When I was 19, I moved to Jerusalem, and then, then finished my story in Montevideo. Okay, so so you so you moved to Jerusalem at 19, and at that point, were you only speaking? Because I'm totally fascinated. You speak seven languages right now. Yeah. Yeah. What are they again? Just tell me again. Uh, Spanish, uh -huh. of course, right, right. language. Uh, Portuguese, mm -hmm. uh, Italian, uh -huh. uh, German, mm -hmm. English, and Hebrew. Okay, so how many did you speak when you first got to Jerusalem? Spanish. Okay, Spanish. Wow. So the first one yeah. was Hebrew. Yeah. Wow. It was kind of weird, you know. You, you land in a country, you can't read anything because it's or in English or in Hebrew or in Arab. Mm. So I say, okay, <clears throat> where I am now. But then <laughs> when I got to the to the university, I understood that it was a good choice. Uh, I learned a lot there, and it was there three years instead of two because they, they at the at the end they gave me a scholarship for three years. And at the third year, uh, the Berlin Philharmonics came to Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And of course, me and all my bass friends were sitting on the first row on the bass side of the concert hall. And uh, I heard Mahler Fifth, Abado, uh, playing by the Berlin Philharmonics. And I say, okay, I think that's, I need to go there. So I went uh, backstage. I took the principal player and I say, who I should kill to study with? <laughs> Really? <laughs> you, you don't need to kill anyone, you just need to get to the Hochschule. I say, okay, how I do it? I can prepare you, he told me. And eight months later, I, I closed everything in Jerusalem and I moved to Berlin, mm -hmm. my base and my luggage again. <laughs> and uh, this teacher, uh, Reiner Zeperitz, was my first teacher. He, he was giving me, a, for sure, I didn't pay, never I paid for it. The best lessons I got in my life, I never pay a penny. Yeah. And uh, he was preparing me, I was playing French bowl. So he, uh, I played for him, and then he took the bow and said, a very nice bow, and he left the room with my bow. <laughs> and he came back with a French and a German bow. He told me, this is your bow. I said, no, this is not my bow. But yes, yes, the other bow, you, you dream about it. It never happened. You know? This is like this, like this, you need to play like that, open strings, come in two days. So he was giving me lessons every two days, mm -hmm. from the 3rd of uh, December until the 16th of February. Mm -hmm. It, during Christmas, all the time. I had to go to him, to his house. And in February, 16th of February, I remember, I play, I think, Eccles, Titersdorf, and something else for the uh, exam to get in the Hochschule, and I got in the Hochschule. And then starts my life again in Berlin, mm -hmm. studying mm -hmm. with, uh, with that guy there. Mm -hmm. And did, did, I'm assuming you didn't speak German until you got to Germany. Of course not. Right, right, okay. <laughs> so again. Of course like, not. Yeah, I had, I had to because uh, I have my diploma. I did my, my degree there. Yeah. So I had to do everything in German too. But, uh, you know, once you live there and, and you love what you're doing, the language is just a way, a way to communicate. Mm -hmm. It's like music, you know. It's, it's not a difficult thing to communicate with people. You just need to know that uh, for chair, you have five words like mm -hmm. silla, chair, kise, stuhl. It's always chair, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's it. It's the only thing you need to get uh, to understand. But uh, it's like music. It's another language to communicate with people. Do you ever play French bow anymore? No, actually, I had to sail my. I had a Red Hudson. Uh -huh. bow very nice bow. Uh, I had to sell it because I didn't have uh, work there. Yeah. And so I need the money. So I'm sorry that I sold it. <laughs> but uh, someday I will get it back. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I didn't have the opportunity, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm always busy with the German bow. Right, right. But we have it. Right, right. <laughs> so in, in, in Berlin... Yes. And studying and switch to German bow and what was the next step for you? I, I just love your journey. So well, what was the uh, <laughs> I started I started there after um, 
six months I was already gigging in an orchestra, in a, in a non-professional orchestra, but the, the, they were playing, it's a crazy orchestra, because they were playing like two rehearsals and concert in the Philharmonie, and the programs, they're all Beethoven, Brahms, you know, big mm-hmm. names. And I had to go there with my German bow, fresh German bow, mm-hmm. and play all the stuff. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was great that I had like four or five concerts in a month with different, different programs. So this, uh, I started to do that, and I was one year with my teacher, with uh, Zeperitz. And then I opened a bit looking for other teachers, so I study private with uh, Saxala, this uh, now sure. solo bass player in the Berlin Philharmonics. I took lessons with uh, Skolline. I took lessons almost with everybody. And then I chose to go to study formally in the, in the Hochschule with the Stoll, mm-hmm. so Klaus Stoll. So I changed from Zeperitz to Stoll, and I was there with him three years. In the meantime, I got, uh, it, you know, there you have these academy positions that uh, you don't audition for an orchestra as a student, and they hire you. So you have a scholarship every yeah. month, and you need to work with them two weeks in a month. Mm-hmm. So I got this in the, one of the radio orchestras. So I was working a lot, and then at the end of the third year with the Stoll, I, I realized that I studied with all the great bass players, but I need something else. So there was an opening day for the violin class in the, in the university. So you had just to go there, there was a list, and to, to write your name. You didn't need to write that you play violin. Because <laughs> I think that was for sure that you play violin, but they didn't ask, so I put my name, and he went there with the bass. So when he came in, they called me, I came in with the bass, and the teacher looked at me, the violin teacher from the Hochschule, told me, look, maybe the bass audition is in the room next to us. <laughs> this is violin. I say, yeah, I know, I know. I want to play with, for you. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, play. So I don't even remember what I play for him. But after that, he came out and he told me, why you want to study with me? So I say, look, I study with all the bass players here, and I need another su- side. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he told me, okay, come every two weeks with a new piece, with your piano player, and bring me the piano score. And I had uh, one year with this violin player, uh, the, I think this was the the way that I could leave the the, the university, finish the university, understanding that the, the road is just the beginning of the road and I still have a long way to go. So I think this violin lessons for me were perfect. More from Diego in a moment, but I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, the Upton Bass String Instrument Company. Upton has been so active over the years. I think back to over a decade ago when I first learned about Upton. One of my former students, Dan Shimolinsky, who now is super active, successful jazz artist based out of New York City, he got not one, but two Upton basses. He got an Upton bass for his orchestral. I think he got it up to base. The first one was for both orchestra and jazz, and he liked it so much that he got a second Upton set up just for jazz. So he had his orchestral Upton and his jazz Upton. That's how much he enjoyed Upton basses. And he's not alone. I've had so many past podcast guests at this point play Upton bass, from Eric Rivas to Lucia Torino. Our upcoming guest, uh, later this week, Anthony Monzo, he had his bass converted into a tra- with a travel neck from Upton. David White, who's playing on Broadway, the list goes on and on. Uh, Kevin Smith, who's Willie Nelson's bassist, he's going to be coming up here soon. Another bassist who plays Upton. They're doing great things for the community, and I just want to thank them for being sponsors, longtime sponsors of the podcast and the blog. Learn more at UptonBass.com. All right, back to our conversation with Diego. Uh, so study with a violin teacher and we were talking about before like, I spent some time studying with a cellist and learned a ton and I found it really interesting to get that ultra perspective like what did you get uh, studying in the violin uh, studio that maybe wasn't covered in the bass world for example getting into the lesson the lesson was for example at four and I was getting there like quarter to four no? mm-hmm. I, I was coming in in the room and the, the um, 
the violinist, the teacher was practicing. And mm -hmm. I remember he was practicing a violin partita. Mm -hmm. So with a lot of chords in the beginning, and, and he saw me, he noticed me that I came in and he told me, come, come, come here. And so he started to play the, the partita and he was doing the melody with the bottom notes, with the lowest note of the chord. Mm -hmm. So he played that and I could really hear that he's doing poly, poly, poly. And then he told me, okay, now I will do the melody with the second note. And bra, bra, he was doing that, that I could hear perfectly what he was, the meaning of, of his line. And he did it with the third note and he did it with the fourth note. And then he turns to me and says, you know what? I'm the happiest man in the world. I say, why? Because now I do what I want. These things I never got in the bass lessons, you know? Or uh, that uh, I'm playing for him some concert and he's taking the music and first sight with the violin, playing so much musically that was what I was doing. Because he was not thinking if I need to play third finger or fourth finger with my nose. Mm -hmm. He was mm -hmm. thinking about the, the phrasing. And this was for me a new era, a new understanding that doesn't matter if you play everything with one finger. Main thing, the music is there. So this is what uh, I can't say that uh, Klaus Stoll or Zeppelitz or my other teachers that were not musically. With the Stoll, you just talk about music, but mm -hmm. from the bass point of view, with the violinist, it was like an open opening my mind to to the big world, let's say, of music. So this is the biggest difference, I think. Well, and that's something that I totally see in your in your playing and in your teaching. That is that musicality, kind of just oozing out of everything you do in the child. So that's 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 fascinating. That that's where that started to really develop for you. For sure, for sure, it started there in that moment that uh, that the, this violin teacher he showed me that there are many ways to understand uh, music and that. Um, the unique, that everyone is unique, and that I can't play like him. I remember he told me that I can't play like you, you can't play like me, nobody can play like nobody else, but uh, you need to get out your way of playing. And uh, and he told me all the tricks, agogics, how to do it, how he, he does it. But uh, he encouraged me a lot to, to dig into this alone, mm -hmm. to be my own teacher. Because he couldn't teach me bass. Yeah. So he was telling me, you need to solve this. You need to solve that. You need to get there. So at the end of the lessons, was always like this. It was like, go, go, yeah, yeah, okay, yes, come in two weeks. <laughs> no? So what was next for you in your journey? After that, I, when I finished the school, I got a job. I was already, I got a job a little earlier, a principal base in uh, Brandenburgische Philharmonie Potsdam, that was an orchestra that uh, after uh, Berlin became a one city, they were un unifying some orchestras. So this one got unified with an another orchestra, so I left. And I win the audition, the Brandenburg Symphonic Solo Bass, and it was there like one year and two months, something like that. I got the, the Pro BR uh, with all the votes, 100% of the votes. I was very happy to stay there. They're great people. But uh, I thought that maybe to go to a country that is more near to my culture and uh, that I can have a job where I have free time to, to be now with you here in Tijuana, for mm -hmm. example, would be the right thing for me. So I knew that... Uh, one of the best, if not the best, uh, orchestra in Spain is this one that the uh, Sinfonica de Galicia, and I knew they have an opening position. So I took the bass again, the plane, the luggage, I came for the audition, I got the job, and I'm there since 2002. So it's 15 years already that I'm doing this with great colleagues in a great orchestra. And in a beautiful place along the sea. Oh, yes, that's <laughs> incredible. You wake up, you see the ocean, and you say, okay, one more day. Yeah, <laughs> I can do it. And in addition to playing in, in the orchestra, you're incredibly active in, <laughs> in the bass world and doing so many things, positive things for the bass community in your home country. Yes, too. yes, we do a lot of things there. But, you know, if I'm incredibly busy, then we get to meet uh, people like Barry Green and mm -hmm. you see that uh, I still have a lot to do and I still a lot of possibilities to do. So I'm getting inspired by people like Barry Green. You feel like what you do is a little bit, but yeah. you need to keep doing that. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, in Montevideo, you know, this system from orchestras, the... They started in Venezuela with the Maestro Abreu. 
So the, there is since almost 20 years that it exists, and I'm head of the base cathedra since four years already, five years. And that means that every Saturday I'm teaching my the students from the cathedra because it's it's like a pyramid. You have a lot of bass players from a lot of orchestras, and then they are taking lessons from the principal basses from these orchestras. And these principal basses are getting lessons from the principal basses of the top orchestras, mm -hmm. and these guys are my students. Mm -hmm. So somehow I get to all the line. I get to the even to the guys, to the smaller kids, because they're getting the lessons from my students. So we are doing that um, every Saturday lessons with Skype. Every four months I go there and I do uh, like a seminar that uh, we all play what we were preparing in the last four months via Skype. I also play, also the kids play, the, everybody, all the bass players of the Sistema, they have to come to Montevideo and play because they are also from other cities. And then we we... We make the list of the works we are going to do via Skype in the next four months. So I live, we work on that on, online, and then every, I come four months later and we perform that for everybody. And it's great, this is Skype lessons, because we are, uh, I have everything recorded. Mm -hmm. So I have the lessons from my students the four years ago that they're in the, in the cloud. Yeah. So I have ac access to them and they have access to them. So we can evaluate the student and the student can always recall the lesson and check what happened what we say how it worked many times they send me videos during the week before the lesson it's a work in progress i'm listening to that i say yes no let's go try this try that so it's like i'm in contact with them almost every day somehow or whatsapp or mm -hmm. and and now we have the festival every four years and this year is going we want to have a big festival again <laughs> Isn't that cool music? Everything you've heard so far today is written by Simon Garcia, and these tracks are from Diego's most recent album. There is a link in the show notes where you can pick it up. Definitely pick it up. It's super cool. Lots of music from Simon and Dave Anderson and many others. And I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, D'Addario Strings, and let you know about the strings I'm using right now on my bass, which are Kaplan Strings. These are incredibly versatile strings. I play mostly orchestral, but some jazz and and some other styles of music too. And Kaplan's are a great all-around string. They've got this buttery, warm sound. They respond great under the bow. They have a nice ring for pizzicato. Highly recommended. Tons of artists are using them. Check them out at Diderio.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Okay, back to the final part of our conversation with Diego Zacharias. Yeah, talk to me about this festival because you were showing me the schedule and putting it together and the obviously the challenges of organizing something on a different continent <laughs> are 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 many, but but congratulations that you had the great turnout for the the first one four years ago, 140 bass players around yeah, there, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just tell tell me about what this event's gonna look like and look, some details. Um we are talking about uh, Montevideo, Uruguay, that is in the corner, the south corner of uh, South America. There is a place that is pretty far away from everything. So um, to make a base event there is like a UFO that is landing in Montevideo. <laughs> so and we did it the first time and we had great musicians. But the main thing, they are all friends. And this is what I, the first thing I want to show all the kids there is that uh, we can play the bass very well, all of us. Uh, but we are great friends and we are all sailing in the same boat. We are all, they and us and everybody. So to get to meet the, the soloist that they see in YouTube personally, to be the journey together, eat together, play together, hear them playing, preparing, practicing, all, all this. And, and we open that to the other countries because in Argentina is a big country, but they don't have a festival like this. In Brazil is huge, but they don't have that. Paraguay, Chile, Ecuador, Venezuela, uh, Bolivia, we are getting bass players from all over the continent mm -hmm. for this event. And, and this is the only event I know that is totally for free. So you just need to have 
the willing of, of, of learning and to share, and that's it. You write yourself, internet, and we wait for you. And we also do for people that are coming from other countries that maybe it's difficult to get the, the plane tickets and the hotel and the meals. So all the kids from the Sistema, they, they give coach or if they have a, an extra bed at home, they, they, they write themselves in a list. So if you write us and you tell, look, I don't have any place to crash, so you will sleep in a, in a musician's house. Mm -hmm. So we are making contact between people that other way they will never meet. Mm -hmm. And and this I think is the is the main thing to to show that uh, that we can do it we can play for each other that doesn't cost money the main thing is we want to be together and to do something you know mm -hmm. to take something home too yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful thing what you're doing and and I just you're one of the most uh, active and energetic musicians <laughs> I've, I've ever met from the from the like throughout the day but here in Tijuana just like you know today I, I interrupted Diego from his master class he was giving an extra master class you know to just teach teaching lessons all throughout the day uh, to these people that most of whom you've never met and just you have such a giving spirit um, what uh, I'm sure that you must learn so much teaching yourself is that is uh, what what inspires you to to work with people i know this is an impossible question but like no. what in, what inspires you to have such passion in your teaching look it's like uh, what we were talking the other day in the car mm -hmm. we are in tijuana and we can see that all over the world it is a um, unfair world mm -hmm. that we are incredibly lucky yeah. to do what we do that uh, we have definitely something to give and uh, what we can give is, is something that they can't buy with money. I mean, they, uh, it's something that uh, I can teach them or I'll, I can share with them because I don't believe I can teach anybody anything, but the, at least I can talk about something, music or bass or... Uh, and this, just that I have the... I'm in the situation that I'm the one that I can give something I, I can't avoid the, the, to do that. Mm. I mean, it, there are people here that are coming from really far away. The situation of the Mexican bass players is not the situation from the European bass players. It's not the reality I see every day. It's more the reality I see in Uruguay, that the people, they really need to struggle to, to play an instrument, to come to the lessons, to be here with us. So I need to give them all of what I have. Mm. I mean, this is the first thing that is inspiring me that uh, I'm a lucky person and I need to share this luck with everybody. Tell them that uh, it's worth to, to be a musician. It's worth to, to play concerts, to play the bass. Uh, that is hard, but uh, it's hard the way, but play the bass is easy. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So I'm trying to make it that part easy for them. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, is the main, the, main, the main motor for me, that when I wake up and I see that a guy is coming from Chiapas, that is like three days uh, travel to come here just to take a lesson with me. So, man, I need to I need to teach him as much as I can. You know? mm. So this, I think, is the main thing. Well, and that giving spirit comes through in your performing too. Diego just mm. played a magnificent recital last night, and and I was playing with Simone Garcia, this bass bass concerto with with bass quartet accompaniment, mm -hmm. which is so fun. I felt so lucky to be a part of that, and you can just see the smiles on the audience's faces, and they're just right along with you throughout the entire performance. Um, how what what are some pieces like like what inspires you to play a particular piece? I just love the repertoire that you picked. You played Mishak, you played this Simon Garcia, you played several several pieces. Like what 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 motivates you to play pieces in a recital? Actually, I'm I'm all, all the time reading new music. Yeah. But um, sometimes our music is music that is talking to me. Mm. I think that the music is picking me up, mm -hmm. and not the other way around. I play just the first bars of Mishak and say, why not? Why not? A great piece. And, and I, I feel a bit ashamed to tell that, but because everybody's studying that during the, during the university time, and I never read it before. So I say, mm -hmm. okay, <clears throat> maybe it's about time I know the piece. And more I, I got to practice that, more I got interested on that uh, yeah. late uh, romantic 
music. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great piece for bass and, uh, and respect very much the um, sonata form that is a dialogue between two players. It's not the, the, the piano, it's not uh, second class. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a very dense work. So I love the music. Simon Garcia. Simon Garcia is a person that uh, you got to meet him. Oh, yeah. You yeah. see, five seconds with him and you feel at home. No? Yes. Like you have, okay, so his music is like him. Mm -hmm. And he has the ability to connect with the heart of the people very, very fast when he's playing. Mm -hmm. And when he's playing, when he's talking, and his music. So in the way that his music talks to other people, it talks also to me. So I'm very happy to be neighbor for him because we don't live far away from each other, like five kilometers from each other. And, uh, and to get his music like um, very fresh. I'm trying a lot of music from Simon. Also in the new CD, I record a lot of pieces from him because uh, I mean, it's someone that must be played, you know, mm -hmm. like Andres Martin too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's just it's super exciting what's going on in terms of composer. I mean, obviously we have our wonderful pieces like Meshach and and Barzini and then but but these contemporary composers like Simone, like Andres. I mean, it's really amazing what's going out there. And I love the new CD, by the way. It's fantastic. Thank you. To, to just what all is on that CD uh, in terms of pieces? It's uh, I wanted just to leave a footprint of what is what are the pieces that. Uh, I like it at most or I felt more identified in the last 10 years or in the last five years when I was playing and um, there's a Tabakov Tabakov Motivi from Tabakov that is a piece that I, I find that is really powerful and uh, with this all folklore music from um, Bulgaria uh, Simon Garcia pieces too the duets and the concertino with the bass monsters this uh, music Dave Anderson yeah. François Rabat music from from now from today from uh, things that we can do with the bass that we could never imagine 20 years ago 30 years ago like uh, Dave Anderson Capriccio number no. 2 that you you're playing Jimi Hendrix on the bass <laughs> yeah. no? in a classical <laughs> concert no? and then people people accept that because mm -hmm. uh, Dave Anderson write, wrote it perfect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so these kind of things uh, motivate me to, to record a CD that, uh, that somehow is a record of what I was Loving at most in yeah, the last yeah, years. Yeah. So I just wanted to have a CD made of, of that music that I think uh, is great music and it's motivating also other people to try it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No? And, and inspiring people to discover some of these pieces that you've fallen in love with. It's, of course. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. And, you know, any, any, you would sound amazing on any bass, any <laughs> bow, whatever, doesn't matter. But I do want to ask just a couple of gear questions. And, yes. and I, I've been thinking about it, uh, but I, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about it on the podcast. So yes. you have this clip uh -huh. <laughs> on the on the peg box, right? Yes. Can you just talk about what that is and what what it does for you? Yeah, of course. This is a um, clip made by Phyton Resonators. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, um, Corrado Faccioni is the the engineer behind that. Uh, he came once to me when I was teaching in Switzerland, and he explained me. Uh, what are the, um, the aurea proportions of the metals of this clip uh, had an influence on the sound and make the sound clear. I say, okay, okay, let's try it. And then we really try it in the theater with the bass and with the bass makers and listen and it, it's true. More you put this clip or the end pin of this material, the bass is getting uh, more clear. The sound. Mm. So uh, also, it's not just me. Patitucci is using that. Uh, Santana is using that. Michel Camilo is doing that. Uh, Dave Holland had a, has a bass all um, set up by Corrado Faccioni from Fight on Resonators. I think it's a, it's a new era of uh, of understanding the sound of the instrument. So he came to me, he, he convinced me, and now I put it in all my bases. I have these systems, but I'm always looking for things like uh, changing the, um, the, um, what you say, the, uh, the tile piece, different yeah, tile piece, sure. different strings. Sure, uh, the, sure. I'm all the time searching for, the, for a new sound mm -hmm. because the perfect, I'm not afraid about perfection because I will never reach it. So I'm trying just to get <laughs> interested in new sounds. So this is Phyton Resonators. And you can see there are many pictures of Santana playing that with a clip in his guitar. Mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. it's great. 
Great. I'll make sure I put a link to that because a lot of people will be interested in what Fight we're on talking resonators. About. But it's, it's super cool. And uh, your, I love I love your bass too. Can you mm. tell me what, the origins of your bass? Mm, this bass I'm playing now is a uh, Guido Mariotto bass. Mariotto is a great and very famous um, bass maker and bass uh, repair in Italy, Mantova. I went to him many years ago with my old Italian bass. That is a Testore um, school. And he fixed it so well that I understood that I found my man on that. So since then, I'm always sending bases to him to fix it, to have it perfect. Until one day I say, Guido, I need a base from you. But you got to do it in the way I want it. So he told me, okay, come next year. Okay. A couple of months later, he called me and said, okay, now. So I asked a model, um, Marcucci model, that is a very famous bass maker from the 1800, 1900, no, 1800. And, um, but I asked the bass a little bit thinner, I mean, not so deep, and the back, flat back with a hardwood, and the top with a slab cut. Mm -hmm. That the old, many, many old Italian basses, they have this slab cut. And this is making the, the top of the bass more flexible. Mm -hmm. and, and this is giving a bit of darker sound that in a new bass is difficult to get. And the um, flat back is giving projection. So this bass is uh, my model of his, um, of his models. Mm -hmm. But I'm very happy. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's great to have a, a bass maker that you just go with the instrument that you don't need to say to him anything. Yeah. He will do it exactly for you in the way you like it because he has it also written down. I mean, in the neck he did to me for my first bass, I did many several necks for other basses. I don't tell him anything. It's exactly the form and exactly the way that I like it for me and for the other people, totally different. Mm -hmm. you know? So this, I'm very happy to work with, uh, with Mariotto in Italy. And a real pain point for bass players everywhere is just getting this bass <laughs> around and you're traveling all over the world. Yeah. And I was very surprised we picked Diego up at the airport and you had a, a large case, but, uh, but and then seeing that you have a removal neck. Uh, can you just tell folks, and this might change, you know, you might start using different things, but what are you using right now in terms of transporting your bass? It's because I used to travel with the small trunk mm -hmm. where the, I took up uh, out of the neck and the normal, this half bass truck. Yeah. The, the problem I found that the, after three or five or four flights, the, the bass case was very much broken. Mm -hmm. So I realized that uh, when the guys there in the airport, when they are working with the luggage, they see a half bass case. It's going just one guy to pick it up. Mm -hmm. And then when he takes it, he, he realizes like, 25 kilos and it's dropping them. Mm. So, but the big cases, they always call another guy, there are two. And if they found these black uh, new cases that are very light, you know, mm. and they find it is light in two, because it's going to be light, mm -hmm. so they treat it a bit more gentle. At least, I don't know if it's, it's true, it's my dream or my wish, but now you see, I came with this big case and the base is healthy. Mm -hmm. So that's why this, try, this time I try to fly like this. The baggage handler psychology. It's, a, it's an important thing to think about, though. You, you, yeah. you mentioned that to me, and it made total sense that, that, yeah. I think it's this, you know, we are always thinking on that, guys, yeah. <laughs> when we take a plane. <laughs> well, I, I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. You, you and Gabriele and uh, I think Dan Stifa and I talked, I think it was us uh, about a year ago for the Royal College of Music event or something like that. We yeah, I don't remember what it was, but I was in Spain. Yeah. And Simon was in Spain. Gabriele was in London. Oh, it was for Galicia. For Galicia Graves. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. we were from four play, different places That's of right. the earth talking together in uh, Skype. Well, I think it's just a privilege, you know, after that conversation, four different places to actually be like sitting here in the same room yeah, incredible. with you. And I know there's a, a, a pack of bases from Tijuana and Mexico City downstairs that really want to keep talking to you. So I want to be respectful of your time. But I just want to ask one, one more thing, if that's okay. And if we could go back to that you were 19 when you came to Jerusalem. Yes. Okay. Go back in time and give 19-year-old Diego some advice. To practice slow and to sing what I'm going to play before I'm playing that mm -hmm. to practice from my brain to my hands and not from my hands to my brain mm -hmm. to do mindfulness or meditation to swim a lot 
and not to practice that much. Um, sometimes it's better to read a good book, to go to the museum, to enjoy life, because the um, the motoric thing of playing the bass is not the main part of playing bass or making music. Music is everything that surrounds us in, in every moment of our life is connected to the music we are going to do. So practice slow, sing the parts, take it easy, try to be cultured, try, try to read, try to, to learn from other people. Remember that uh, to teach and to learn is the same thing with different, in many languages it's the same word. And to be humble because uh, everything, music and the pieces, is everything bigger than us. We are just one little piece in the side of the good people that uh, do good things, we do concerts, we do something that uh, is making people happy. Mm -hmm. So even if the way is hard, uh, it's worth to, to walk that path. So I would say that, just keep doing, slow down, sing a lot, swim, read. Such a pleasure, Diego. Thank you, and I <laughs> want to tell you that uh, not just me, uh, many, 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 many hundreds of thousands of bass players in the world, we really appreciate what you do. Now, to go to Contrabass Conversations and to have all this incredible list of bass players, a podcast that you can learn from them, like uh, like calling them on the telephone and uh, you call Gary Peacock and talk to him, you know, <laughs> because the only difference is that you are talking to him, but you are asking the questions we want to ask. Right. So I, I in, beha in behalf of all of them, I need to thank you very much for what you do. You are a pioneer and I hope you keep doing that and you never give up because we really need you. Oh, well, I, I appreciate that. I, I appreciate yeah, it. Thanks. Thank Diego, you very much, Jason. Pleasure. Pleasure to play with you. <laughs> I know. Exactly. We are going to play together again tomorrow, we're right? Playing that, we're playing tomorrow the, uh, f uh, what are we, is it Contra, Contra, <laughs> what are we going to play tomorrow? What are we playing? We have a concert Andre, tomorrow. Yeah, I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Piazzola. A range, He's arrangement. contrabajeando in uh, Andres Martin arrangement, yeah. four bases yeah. and an orchestra, and 20 bass players in the bass section. Yeah. We well, sound loud. It sounds loud and epic, and I've got a lot of video clips of it already, and I'm sure we'll have more. So nice, nice. Fun. It's going to be a pleasure to play with you again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, Diego. Loved hanging out with you, Diego. So much fun. That last selection, by the way, is by Dave Anderson, one of his four short pieces for solo double bass. Totally cool piece, right? You can learn about Diego's most recent album and everything he's up to at his website, diegozecharias.com including that fabulous Montevideo festival that he's putting together. Man, I wish I could have made it this year for that, but hopefully I will in the future. Thank you so much for joining us today. If this is your first episode, welcome. I'd love to have you check out what we've done over the past 11 years, I guess at this point it is. And I think the best way to do that is our app, which is found at ContrabasConversations.com slash app. We have an iOS, Android, and Kindle app. It's totally free, and it's a super useful way to search through the archives. We have some bonus content that we only put out in the app, and we keep it updated. So it's hopefully going to be a useful resource for you in your career whenever you're on the go and you want to listen to some stuff. If you're on a plane, you want to load up some interviews about a particular topic, say auditioning, you could just type auditioning and every episode we've ever done on auditioning will pop up there. You can then favorite those or download those or email those to a colleague or a friend or a student. Super useful. And speaking of email, I would love to have you get in touch with me. Feedback at ContrabasConversations.com is the email for that. And let me know what you think of this show or any show, any ideas you have for guests or other topics. I totally appreciate that. And while you're on your computer, go ahead and get on our email list, which is a vibrant community of bass players. We chat about what's going on in the double bass world beyond the podcast there on the email list. I send out bass news of the week and all that kind of good stuff, events that are coming up, that kind of thing. So thank you so much for joining us and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>